Um, when Nick and I work together in, in Sheffield, when Nick was my chaplain, we have a lot in common. And one of the things we have in common is that we tend to be a bit on the vague side when it comes to organising things. Uh, and and we, uh, I tend to sort of play it a bit by ear. So I can't give you a very strict plan of, you know, at, at quarter to eleven we'll do this and then at quarter past it'll be, and, and split it all up. I just, we're just going to do it and we finish when we finish. So if we finish a bit earlier this afternoon, we finish a bit earlier. And I'm not going to send you off in groups or anything like that. I'm just going to waffle on a bit. But please interrupt at any time you want to. And every so often I'll just stop and say, right, talk to your next door neighbour and let's have a little question. And we'll go through it a bit like that, yeah? Um, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm never quite clear what I'm up to any more than Nick is. And we used to try to... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, and, and our secretary, uh, uh, officially my secretary, uh, the Bishop Secretary in Sheffield, Sue, who is a, a, a love and, a, and must be a saint to put up with both of us because we used to, did we not, Don't we used to drive her around and twist <laughs> all the time because she wanted everything, you know, just like that. And uh, I'm afraid we're not like that at all. Presiding at the U This diocese, so Nick tells me, um, the Diocese of Hereford is, is fairly sort of C of E. <clears throat> Some dioceses where you go and work are full of extremes. You, you know, if there's a big city like Sheffield, there are, I mean, I had 10% of my parishes in Sheffield had passed all the three resolutions. So 10% of the clergy uh, were under the pastoral care of the Bishop of Beverley uh, because they couldn't accept the ordination of women. Uh, we, we had the largest evangelical reform church in England outside London place called Christ Church Fulford. And so, so with quite a lot of, of, of extremes about it. <coughs> and, and, and I think that is probably not the case in the Hereford Diocese. Indeed it's not the case in, in most rural or semi-rural dioceses where there isn't a very large city. That's, that's just... Now, now that, that, that does make a difference. Um, it's a great advantage in you see, it seems to me that the Church of England, which has always been so divided, you know, the evangelicals there and the Catholics there, it's a pity they don't get back together. For the simple reason that evangelicals are much better at getting people than Catholics are. Much better at the evangelism stuff and getting people in. The problem is they don't know what to do with them when they've got them. <laughs> Apart from saying the same things over and over again. Yeah. But the more Catholic end is usually pretty hopeless at getting people. <clears throat> but they do have a great store of riches in terms of what I call sanctification or deepening people on the worship side. And between us in the Church of England, the Anglican Church actually has got a lot. Um, a, a great deal, which other churches don't have. I'm very pleased to be an Anglican um, because we've got what other church, a lot of other churches. When I went off to um, Italy on a conference many years ago, it was a big interfaith conference, and there were lots of uh, there were cardinals there and page, God knows, so everybody was anybody. Uh, and when when they made speeches. The cardinals always said, you know, brethren of the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, churches, the Anglican Church, and the churches of the Reformation. They, they, in other words, they regarded us as somehow a bit different, and in a category of our own. Um, and, and I think that's, that's really a rather important thing to say about, about being an Anglican. And what I say about presiding at the Eucharist, um, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to sort of take an angle. All I want to do is to try to help you to think. I'm not going to say this is the way you should do it. And if you do it that way, you're wrong. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is go through things and just say, have you thought about this? Because of what I want you to be able to do is if some newcomer comes to your church and says, why do you do that? 
you should be able to say why, what you do and why you do it. Yeah? We might disagree completely about it, you and I. That's not of any importance, really. But what is important is that you just don't do it and you don't know why. Well, we'd always do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Why, why, do, why, you know, why does the church warden have to pick his nose during the peace? <laughs> He's always done. So why is he? It's what we call a tradition. So that's, that's what we do. I had a church warden when I was a kid in the 1970s. It was Albert was absolutely wonderful, but he never stayed for the sermon. He always went out to have a cigarette during the sermon, and then came. He always timed it beautifully because I never preached for more than ten minutes. So he just time to have a leisurely cigarette and then come back in. It was it became a tradition, you know, it was almost in the job description. <laughs> um, but the, I suppose the most important thing I want to say about the Eucharist and about presiding at the Eucharist um, comes from my childhood. Um, and I tell this story everywhere I go, and I may have said it before to you, but it bears repeating. Um, I was prepared for confirmation at the age of 13 by George Hamilton Richards, who was our new vicar. He arrived in November, and he died on my 14th birthday in July. So we only had him for eight and a half months. He couldn't preach for Toffee. He couldn't organize a booze up in a brewery. He was hopeless with money. But he was closer to God than any priest I have ever met before or since. And my ambition in life, which I have never achieved, wasn't to be the Archbishop of Canterbury, but was to be half the priest, Mr. Richard. What was it about him? And how did I see it. Well, it was the way he celebrated the Eucharist. It was just the way he did it. And the way he did it was God-centered. You know, we might as well not have been there. But it was so God-centered. And when it came to, you know, those wonderful, wonderful words, Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company. I always we used to get down on the floor and we used to sing holy, holy. And it's, it's as if the doors open and, um, and, and, and heaven was there. Um, and somehow that, that's, that's what it's around. So the most important thing I can say to you about presiding at the Eucharist is pray. Pray the Eucharist. You pray the Eucharist. When you're first ordained, um, you, you, you know, you, you're conscious of the mechanics. It's like learning to drive a car. You know, at which gear am I in? Am I in third? Should I be in second? <coughs> and then one day a penny drops and you're no longer self-conscious about driving. Now you just drive. Uh, and, and, and it's a bit like that eventually, I think, with presiding at the Eucharist. At first, it is very difficult to worship when you're presiding because it's, what do I do next? Do I put my hands do it? Is, you know, and you're worried about the mechanic. But the point comes when you've got that done, that you, you, know, you are free. And you are free you know, to be Godward. You're free to be Godward. And that matters more than the niceties of doing things right or doing things wrong. You must pray the Eucharist. It is the most important thing you do. It is the shop window of the church. It is what Jesus told us to do. One of, you know, apart from loving one another, it was one of his great commands, do this. And the church has been doing it in all sorts of ways for 2,000 years. <coughs> I want to read you a poem. It's um, a poem about the Eucharist and about presiding at the Eucharist. And I think, you might agree with me, 
that it says what I want to say. It's about a Roman Catholic Mass in Ireland. And it's called, it's entitled, The Twelve O'Clock Mass, Roundstone, County Galway, 28th of July, 2002. That's the title. <laughs> and it goes like this. On Sunday the 28th of July, 2002, the summer it rained almost every day, in rain, we strolled down the road to the church on the hill overlooking the sea. I had been told to expect a fast mass, 20 minutes, a piece of information which disconcerted me. Out onto the altar hurried a short, plump priest in late middle age with a horn of silver hair in green chasuble billowing like a poncho or a kaftan over white surplus and a pair of Reeboks, mammoth trainers. <laughs> he whizzed along, saying the readings himself as well as the gospel, yet he spoke with conviction and with clarity. His every action, an action of what looked like effortless concentration, like Tiger Woods on top form. His brief homily concluded with a solemn request. To the congregation he gravely announced, I want each of you to pray for a special intention, a very special intention. I want each of you in the sanctity of your own souls to pray that in the All-Ireland Championship hurling quarterfinal <laughs> this afternoon at Crow Park, Claire will beat Cole. <laughs> the congregation splashed into laughter, and the church became a church of effortless prayer. He whisked through the consecration, as if the consecration was something that occurs at every moment of the day and night. As if betrayal and the overcoming of betrayal were an every minute occurrence. As if the consecration was the now, in the now of the Hail Mary prayer. Pray for us now and at the hour of our death. At the sign of peace, he again went somber. As he introduced the, as he instructed the congregation, I want each of you to turn round and say to each other, you are beautiful. The congregation was flabbergasted but everyone fluttered and swung round and uttered that extraordinary phrase, you are beautiful. I shook hands with at least five strangers, two men and three women, to each of them saying, you are beautiful. And they to me, you are beautiful. At the end of mass, exactly 21 minutes, the priest advised, now go and enjoy yourselves, for that is what God made you to do. Go out there and enjoy yourselves, and to pray that in the All-Ireland Championship early in the quarter-final between Galway <coughs> Croke Park, Clare will win. After Mass, the rain had drained away into a tide of sunlight on which we sailed out into St. Macdara's Island and dipped our sails, both of us smiling, radiant sinners. In a game of pure delight, Claire beat Galway by one point. Claire, one goal, and 17 points. Galway, 19 points. Pray for us now, and at the hour of our death. I think that's very beautiful. Because it says something about the unself-consciousness of worship. You know, that, that, that actually, what's out there, and what's in church, should be... Like that. You know how some people walk through the door of church and leave everything that's human about them outside and come in wearing a mask and put on another face. And everything, even, the, you know, I shall talk about this later, the clergy put on a different voice, a church voice, and people, as if it's not real life. So again, you see, apart from praying the Eucharist and it being God, make it human. You know, it should be the most natural of activities. 
not an artificial do thing that you do by opting out of life. One should flow, and this, you know, this priest, I think, you know, I've got that. He did a lot of things wrong in terms of what the rules say in the Roman Catholic Church of how you should say mass. But overriding all of it, it was very clear that you know, here was someone who didn't get in the way of what we're talking about. Didn't get in the way of seeking God. <coughs> right, let's have the next slide. Yeah, we've got it. Oh, yeah, you're good. <coughs> he was always good at stuff like that. I was always good at stuff like that. The purpose of worship is very simple. It is to join in the worship of heaven. To join in the worship of heaven. The Orthodox Church, of which St. Nick knows only two now, I am very fond. Sorry, have you lost your picture? Yeah. Uh, we lost, uh, we lost, uh, we lost uh, oh well, I'll still talk. <laughs> uh, the, 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 in the Holy Orthodox, yeah, church, you know, the, the 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 word Orthodox means right glory, uh, literally. Orthodox means right doxa glory. Yeah. In other words, it, it, it's right to be Orthodox means you worship right. You give glory to God. Uh, and, and the Orthodox believe that worship is about entering into the worship that already goes on. I mean, the worship of the angels, that's why we say therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company. And all those people we can't stand. <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I, I, I um, again, Nick knows this, uh, my, my least favourite saint in the whole world is a man called St. Wilfred of Ripley. <laughs> can't stand them. I mean, he, he was a, a Romanizing prelate who, 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 who made uh, and Whitby went the wrong way because of him. Yeah, and Hilda was defeated. Yeah, yeah, all, and all that. But he was a prelate. He, he, he was. A, he was. Uh, why he was ever canonized, I have no idea. Right. <laughs> so I cannot stand St. Wilfred. One of my clergy in Sheffield, Alan Parkinson, who was one of the fallen in favour, and very high. Very high indeed. Used to slip off to Rome every five minutes and come back with relics. And of course, on one of his journeys, he bought a relic of a little bit of a, a little bit apparently of St. Wilfred, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and presented me with this. And, and, and I put I put the little relic of St. Wilfred on the little altar in, in, in my chapel. The, the reason being this: every time I said. Therefore, with angels, <laughs> you know, I realized I could not celebrate the Eucharist unless I was in communion with people I can't stand and with whom I completely disagree. Yeah? The church is not a society of the like-minded. And we all tend to try to make it. Wherever we come from, there's nothing more intolerant than a good liberal. <laughs> yeah. It's not. It's. It's. I'm not. I'm not getting at anyone. I'm saying all of us. Whatever your stable, you know. I mean, if we're not careful, um, we, we, we we make our churches. I know. I know some very successful churches. Very successful churches, where the incumbent has got a fan club and a big fan club because he's a big person or she, big personality. They're good at the job. And they get people around them. When they leave, everybody stops going to church, and people say, "Wasn't she wonderful? She was a catastrophe." Because she created a community of the like-minded. And one of the most difficult tasks in ordination is actually to bring people in who are very different from you, and think differently, and challenge you, and really stretch you, and people who you can't stand. Yeah. Uh, that therefore, with angels and like it. And worship <coughs> is to say, we all of us together are joining in the worship of heaven. That's why, if you go into the Orthodox Church, 
you will find always at the front, you will be faced with this great screen yeah, of icons. Uh, uh, there will be Jesus and Mary, the mother of God, and the saints all over the place. And you won't be able to see the altar. I, I mean, that, the door shut. Uh, and it all goes on, and you think, well, isn't that's not, we like to be up, we like to be around the table, don't we? And, and, all, and all gathered in. But they, they don't think of it like that at all, it's a different mindset. The icon of stasis is not considered to be a wall, it's a window. It's considered to be a window. Because you are joining in the worship in all those four there. And the worship of heaven. That's how they look at it. So that's what worship is now in the Church of England. We don't tend to do it. We tend to think of worship as being something which worship is not. Worship is not there primarily to educate. It is not there in order to educate people, to teach them. If you learn from the Eucharist. Wonderful. But it is not the purpose of the Eucharist. The only purpose of the Eucharist is to join in the worship of heaven. So your primary person isn't to turn it into a teaching instrument. Alright, you'll be preaching, there will be things about it that will be teaching, but it's not the primary purpose of the Eucharist. It is not to uplift and stop going to church because it doesn't do anything for me. Hmm? I don't feel better when I've been. I don't feel moved by the worship now. Hmm. It leaves me cold. And the purpose of going to church is increasingly to be, to be um, given spiritual kicks. Yeah. It's not that. This one, it is not to entertain, which follows on from that. It is not to entertain. You wouldn't know that. <coughs> one of the problems with having been a bishop for 25 years next year, um, one of the problems with having been a bishop, you have to, every Sunday you go in different churches. Uh, and, 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 and I always ask myself the question, if I was a lay person living in this parish, could I put up with this <coughs> every Sunday? And I reckon the answer seven times out of ten is probably not. Right? That says as much about me uh, as it does about the church. Um, but, I mean, and, 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 and bishops usually see churches at the best. So I dread to think what it's like. How does that when the bishop talks? I think, my God, what was it, what, you know, what was it like last week? Um, but if you notice, and I might say something about this letter, um, we increasingly sit down for worship. I mean, in some places, you hardly do anything but sit. Which is, it's, it's not about what I give, it's about what I, you know, what I receive. Which isn't the purpose of worship. It's about, you know, I will sit there and at the end I'll hold two cards up, you know, 5.3, <laughs> for the performance of the vicar or the standard of worship. There is nowhere in the Bible, in the Bible, it talks about prayer. In the Old Testament of the New Testament, nowhere does it talk about sitting for prayer. Hmm. Nowhere. It talks about prostrating for prayer. It talks about standing for prayer. It talks about kneeling for prayer. But it doesn't talk about sitting down for prayer. And Anglicans, when I was a kid, used to look down their noses at Methodists and Baptists because they prayed in what they call the shampoo position. <laughs> <laughs> and they look down the nose and say you're always bobbing up and down. <laughs> yeah. But we have got into this, as it were, entertainment culture where it's what worship does for me. Do I feel better when I've been? Am I educated? You know, am I entertained? Worship is not about if any of those things happen, fine. There's nothing wrong in any of those things, huh? provided that they are not what you're gearing yourself to. There's nothing wrong with a laughing church. You know, I mean, the Galway thing, you know, 
uh, uh, that, that, that was, there's nothing wrong in any of that. But it isn't the purpose of it. There's nothing wrong in being educated, entertained, uplift, made to feel better, or even meet friends. When worship is God-centered, like Mr. Richards, who sort of inspired me, then of itself, not an Anglican, but a John Wesley, well he was an Anglican, but John Wesley described the Eucharist as a converting audience. That's Wesley. A converting audience. But actually people have been brought to God, not just through preaching, not just through prayer, not just through but by experiencing experience <laughs> so go on to the next slide you can put it all on it. Oh, I, don't, I don't have to say anything <laughs> it's about the creature approaching the creator um, it's not about us The, the, the well-known Prince Vladimir of Russia, just over a thousand years ago, wanted to, to his people to follow one religion. He sent off messages, <coughs> so the tradition says, and he, he sent them to um, Islamic countries, and they worshipped in mosque. And he sent them further east, and, and they shared in, in Buddhist meditation. And he sent them off to worship in the church of St. Sophia in, in, in Constantinople, uh, in the Orthodox Church. <coughs> and they came back and said, we've just been to heaven. The doors were open in heaven. And so Prince Vladimir said, the Russian people will be Orthodox. And that's why the Russian people are Orthodox in this day. It's because of the worship in St. Sophia. I don't know if anybody's been there. You know, some people say the greatest covered space in the world, but there we are. Public worship is not private prayer writ large, and I shall say a lot about that. <coughs> you know, private prayer flows from public prayer, but it isn't the same. It contains the elements of Adoration, confession. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, I haven't gone on yet. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, um, supplication. As does private prayer. But, but, but when we worship together, it isn't about how. It isn't about me and God. It's 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 about an us. Um, one of my great friends is a, a nun, Sister Edmy. Uh, uh, of the Sisters of the Love of God in Oxford. Um, she's frightening. I mean, she's highly intelligent. The first time I met her, when I was a young vicar, I was only in my late 20s, and uh, we were snowed in, and I was helping to clear the snow at the convent. And this, this uh, novice, she was a novice then, Sister Edmure, who's the double of Penelope Keith. <laughs> well, she looks like her and talks like her, I and mean, she's just like her. And she turned to me and said, Father, she said, why do you think St. Thomas Aquinas insisted on using Aristotle's epistemology? <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't talk about that. Well, <laughs> She's quiet, but, but she, she gave a lovely uh, lecture once on vocation. And, and, and she explained that there are three vocations. There is a common vocation in which we all share <coughs> through our baptism. Yeah? To be Christians, to live a Christian life, you know, a common vocation <coughs> of all baptized Christians. A common vocation. And she said, there's no higher vocation than that. There is no higher vocation than the common vocation to be a baptized Christian. The second vocation is the particular vocation which is some people have from within the, their baptismal vocation. Some people are called out to be, for example, priests. Yeah? That's the particular vocation. 
And the third vocation is the unique vocation. The fact that you are unique and your relationship with God is unique. And nobody can have that relationship with God in the same way that you can. You can love God in a way that nobody else knows. God loves you in a way nobody, you know, he loves nobody else. And that, that, that journey into God for the individual, yeah, that's why we have spiritual direction, that's why, to, to help us in our individual. But it's important to differentiate the, the common, the particular, and the unique vocation. And when we're talking about worship, we're talking about our common vocation. And some of us exercising our particular vocation. But our unique vocation is for elsewhere. It's not, it's, it's not for him. You can move on that, no? Yes, boss. Yeah, all right. Um, <clears throat> there are three things I want to talk about not getting in the way, because the purpose of our job is not to get in the way of other people seeing them. Yeah? And, and, and how we are makes all the difference. It either helps or it hinders people seeing God. Yeah. People get in the way. And it's not just the priests, the readers, the interceders, the scientists, the people who you know, refuse to pass you the peace, whatever. They, they help or hinder. Yeah. So people. We mustn't let ourselves or others get in the way of other people seeing God. Building, the building can either help or it can either lift you up and take you to heaven or it can put you off completely. And the right that we use, the words that we use, um, we don't want those uh, to get in the way. Uh, by and large, by and large, what is not essential is a potential distraction. What is not essential mm. is a potential distraction. And the big thing is um, clutter. Clutter, <coughs> extra things that get in the way. Uh, <coughs> so let's just move on from there to the buildings. Um, and put the things, you can put them all over. When you go in, if you if you go into uh, the average church, there are three essentials. One is a font, the means of entry into the body of Christ, and symbolically that is there for the the appropriate place for that is somewhere near the back of the church. Although it should be somewhere that is visible, but, and increasingly it's being brought out of the corner. Uh, but, but it's, it's, it's uh, the table of the word. You only need one of them. Now I know I'm, I know I'm, 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 uh, 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 the practicalities of this are impossible in some places um, because most churches you've got, you've got an eagle and a pulpit. You don't need them both. Actually, you only need one, and it's better actually only to have one. So what, what, what we call what the, the liturgy is called the table of the word where the word is broken up. Yeah. And, 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 and that table of the word uh, should be the place from which the readings happen uh, and, and from which the sermon is preached. But we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll come to that later. And the table of the sacrament. Yeah. The table of the word, the table of the sacrament, and the font. Most it's much, much better if there's only one of each. Because people, um, someone once said, you know, when you communicate, 68%, uh, 68% of your message is how you live. 25% of your message is the way you sound. 7% of your message are the words that you use. That's what the experts in communication say. But I'll say that again, shall I? Because it's a bit scary. <laughs> 68%. When you see somebody on the television, 
quite often you make your mind up about them before they've opened their minds. Yeah? Whether you like them or not, whether you want to listen to them. 68% of your message is how you look. 25% of your message is how you sound. Yeah. The voice can really put a lot in. And only 7% of your message are the words that you use. <coughs> Which is um, um, interesting. And, and, and um, well, let's move on to the next one. Can I interrupt? Sorry, you? yeah. Can I just ask, is it possible to have this um, kind of PowerPoint as well as it Yeah. Is there a we can distribute way? the. All right, yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't have to be right. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Surely, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to stop soon anyway, and then I will have a little, uh, a little chat about it. Um, a, a, great, a dear friend of mine, bless him, and rest his soul, was the Roman Catholic Bishop of Lancaster when I was Bishop of Lancaster. Jack Rubber. And we were both Bishops of Lancaster and both called Jack. So it got very confusing. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, we could have swapped places. He became a very close friend. Uh, and, and he had his cathedral sort of reordered beautifully. You know, they had everything done as, as, as it should be done to all that. Uh, and I, when he showed me around, I said, I said, this reordering is good. We never talk about reordering. He said, we always talk about restoration. <laughs> he said, because if you talk about reordering, that's change and people don't like it. <laughs> if you talk about restoration, that's putting it back. As it was, and so that's all right. So actually, on a sale, you know, you want a sale attack, and when you're wanting to do things in church, don't talk about reordering. Talk about restoration, and it's a, it's just an interesting. But more, most churches for restoration or reordering, all they need really is to get rid of clutter. Most churches are full of clutter. The, day, the trouble is in the Church of England, of course that we're so fond of brass plaques, uh, uh, you know. So every bit of furniture is to the glory of Mrs. Bloggs yeah. and, and in remembrance of God or something like that. But there's, you know, they put a little plaque and, and therefore if you dare to move it, you know, there's all hell let loose, isn't there? Because the great-grandfather was this and that. Oh, oh. Uh, and all that. But, but, but I mean, really, it, it's not a big job reordering or restoring the altar. It's getting rid because there are too many altars, too many lecterns and too. When you walk into a church, you should focus on what the building is for. Yeah. I, I, the, the most impressive tour, guided tour I ever had of a cathedral was the first time I ever went to visit the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. And the English guide, the English speaking guide who took us around, stood us outside and she said at the beginning, she said, no, she said, I want to show you what this place is for. This place is for. She said, this place is to show the world that Jesus Christ is both God and man. And that is the purpose of this building. And I want to take you around the church and show you how this place shows that Jesus Christ is both God and man. You say, well, why is it called Notre Dame? And there are statues of Mary all over the place. Yes, but every one of them, she is holding Jesus. Her only purpose is to present Jesus to the world. And we went all around Notre Dame that great day. She never said anything about this is the biggest, this is the oldest, this is the 15th century this, and this is the 19th century that. She just talked about it was a spiritual journey. It was a pilgrimage. And when we ended up going round, I don't know if you know Notre Dame, but on the outside of the choir there's a medieval carved frieze of, of incidents from the life of Christ. And, and we ended up going round that, and the last frieze is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And there is Jesus praying to his Father, and there is a cloud, and there is the face of the Father in the cloud, looking down on Jesus. And the face of the Father and the face of the Jesus are exactly alike. She said, that's what we're here for, to show you that Jesus Christ is both God and man. Not to show off how much money we've got, or how great our patrons have been over the years, to give us this, that, and the other. But that's what it's for. And when you walk into a church, it should say, what is it for? It is for baptism. 
It is for the preaching, the breaking of the word, and for the breaking of the dead. So those are the three things that your eyes should rest on. Yeah. Those are the three things that your eyes should rest on. Not, not the overhead projector. Yeah? Not half a dozen altars all over the place. You might have one somewhere for weekdays and stuff. One of each. Getting rid. Bishop Jack. Sure. What I struggled with, um, I came back into the parish ministry after a period of time away from it. Uh, and I, I, I haven't done the 662 program, so it's so thrown into that. Yeah, yeah. With the creatures of bread and wine, and appreciations of this and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and although I, I kind of um, got it, mm. you know, it, it's it's the sort of tension I think between uh, the memorial mm -hmm. and the living presence. Yes. And I was caught between the and Deepus and Seaman yeah. was doing that because although I, I wasn't doing it for myself, I was doing it, you know, hopefully not for myself, yeah. but, but for them not to be distracted from that. I was still torn between this. Dialogue between the living presence and memorial. I couldn't say memorial because yeah. it, it was just dead for me. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think that that, that is um, that's a problem that we've got. I mean, I can talk a bit. I will do later when we come and talk about the right and which right you use and yeah. the advantages and disadvantages of different ones. But I mean, I think the, there's a wonderful sermon by a man called Eamon Duff, who was a liturgist, um, a layman, Roman Catholic layman. And he, he was preaching at, um, at the, the commemoration of benefactors at one of the Oxbridge colleges, the annual thing when they commemorate benefactors. And he said, of course, the difference that the Reformation made uh, was that uh, uh, when these chapels were founded, the benefactors founded them and gave them money because they wanted the prayers of the people to pray for their souls. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, now they are not people in need of our prayers. They, we put them on a pedestal and make a statue of them, and we they, they are dead heroes. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and it's a very different it's a very different attitude. Uh, that, that um, you know, what are the saints to you? Are the saints those people with whom uh, angels and archangels and all you are worshipped, or are they dead heroes? Well, at the Protestant end of the spectrum, they're dead heroes. At the Catholic end of the spectrum, there are friends in heaven. Yeah. Um, and it's what Nick was saying, you know, I mean, memorial is, is not necessarily a dead thing. No. Remembrance is a much better word. Yeah. Because it means bringing the past into the present. Well, I, I substitute the celebration, yeah, rather than the remembrance, yeah. because then it's a far more dynamic yeah. thing. And, 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 and actually, theologically, the 1662 has a, 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 an awful lot to be designed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there we are. Um, but at the end of the day, God works through all these things. I, I, I love Orthodox worship on that oh, don't have any ideas, yes. <laughs> and, um, and, um, uh, and, and I don't understand anything that's going on. No. I mean, I can see a rough outline, of what, but it doesn't matter, actually. Uh, the, the business of accessibility is a very interesting one. If you think worship is education, then it needs to be accessible and all that. But actually, you don't need to understand. You know, the most important things in life, we really do not need to understand them. If, can, can I raise a question then? Why do we restrict the Eucharist in the way that we do from children? From why don't we let it be what it is? Let it be open. It's a very good question. I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you see, all age worship is usually worship for the under sevens. And actually, the, the, it's about being unself conscious. I, 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 when, I, when I was in Russia uh, visiting my best friend in heaven, St. Seraphim of Zaroff, and, uh, but when I was in Russia, I can remember on a Sunday morning going to a little village church, which was packed to the seams, 
And in Russia, they don't go in and come out every five minutes, you know, like they do sometimes in Greece. I mean, they're there for three hours. And there were families there, children, babes in arms, all age. They were all age, but the liturgy was the liturgy that doesn't move for a thousand years. But everybody felt at home. We've got to sit like you're sitting now in solid ranks and all stand up together and sit down together and all that. But, not the, but they didn't, you see. They were no, nowhere to sit anyway. Um, but the, so, and there was this young family. There was a, a mother with a baby in her arms, and there was a father, and they were looked like twins, about two long haired lads, about four. And mum, with all the liturgy going on, she has the baby in her arms, and she's walking around the icons, getting hold of the baby's head, and putting it to kiss the icon, getting its hand, and, and and doing, making the sign of the cross and moving around and saying the prayers. Well, all that's going on. The worship of heaven's going on anyway. But that's what she was doing. The father on the floor, kneeling down with his forehead on the floor, you know, in adoration. And the two little boys were playing cowboys and Indians. And, and then they went off to light a candle because it was very fun. Mm -hmm. Nobody bats an eye with it. Because it's as natural to be in church as it is to be in the pub mm -hmm. or the marketplace. And we're not like that. I mean, can you imagine? Oh, for real, can you imagine? So, I mean, people, you, you know, you talk about being excluded. But, you see, because we are so self-conscious about religion. You see, in the East, sorry, I'm going off it all now, but never mind. But in, in, the, in the Eastern Church, I mean, you say, do you believe in God? So what a silly question. You know, as if God is another object, like the moon, or the man in the moon, or dragons, or do you believe in them? God isn't another thing to believe. But in the West, you see, because of the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Enlightenment, and scholasticism in the Middle Ages, and you can talk all these fancy language, but at the end of the day, what the Western Church has done is compartmentalized everything. Tick the boxes, or you're in, you're out. You know, we, we need to go know who's in heaven. We need to know who's in some I'm out of camera. So, <laughs> we need to know who's, who's in heaven, who's in hell, who's right, who's wrong. You fit in that box, you're in that box, you see. That's a God box, yeah? That's real life. <coughs> the Orthodox just can't think like that. I mean, you know that God is. Well, he said, does the air exist? <laughs> you know, what a silly question. Because it all spills over. It's all, it's a different mindset. And we are stuck, especially post-Reformation, with this Western mindset. You know, it's all here. It's all here for us. Uh, and, and, and it's not like that, you see. It's not like that in the West. So, we can have, I'm, I'm, I'm indirectly, trying to, I think, I think you do it. Very interesting, isn't it? That across the board, the churches in England in the last 20 years, which have displayed more numerical growth than any others are cathedrals. Cathedrals. Isn't it interesting? People come in, the worship goes on. You go out, you see, you go into your parish church if you're a man, particularly, sorry about this, if you're a man and you're 40, you know, the first time you're in the door, the biggest spot should be the church one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because we haven't got any men. <laughs> <laughs> and we drain people of energy. You know, and, we are, and the, church is, the church is far, far, far too busy and far, far, far too focused on survival. You know, Christianity is about death and resurrection. It is not about survival. Jesus never talked about it. You know, Christianity has never been, and yet you wouldn't know that. You know, we talk about mission and evangelism. Why? Most churches I know talk about mission and evangelism. We'd better do something about it. Otherwise, because we're getting older and the numbers are going down, we're going to die. And that is the final tragedy. We must survive, therefore we'll be evangelistic. 
I mean, that, I, I mean, that's a caricature. But that's sometimes why we have all these strategies and stuff like that. They're not coming out of a heart of love. They say, gosh, do you know, I've won the, I've won the lottery. I want to share it with you. That's the only motivation for mission. You know, God has touched my heart. I don't have to talk about it. As St. Francis says, you know. You, you know, preach the gospel, but only use words if you must. What I said about, you know, 7% of your message are the words that you use. I was drawn into the priesthood by a priest who couldn't preach. But it was hard to God to touch. You know, and that's what the church should be as well, you see. And so this business of accessibility and, and, and all, all, all that is really very secondary. Is really very second. Um, and I, oh, go on, I'll just do this. Well, shall I? Yes, I'll just do this one, then, then I'll stop for a bit. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, in the rest of the time after this, I'm, 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 uh, in a bit, I'm going to start talking about, about the right. And, and, and what we do and how we do it. But this is all by way. Sorry, it's a long time doing it. It, it, it. This is about introduction. And, and this is about, I, 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 we talk about buildings and we're going to talk about music because they're the things that either help or in worship. And people, you know, as well as I do, people either help or hinder. Some people stop going to church because they don't like the vicar. Yeah? Some people start coming because they do like the vicar. Uh, and, 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 and therefore, um, it behoves us in our own temple way to be as close to God as we can. Because the people who are closest to God are the people who get in the way least. I mean, that, that, that's got to be the bottom line, I'm afraid. But let's look at the little practical things. Let's imagine on a Sunday morning. And it's a Eucharist, and there is a priest presiding at the Eucharist. The priest's appearance matters, because it either helps or hinders. <coughs> what does she or he wear will either help or hinder. I saw an interview on television with a priest from a very large uh, well-known church in London, who was went on about the fact that he wanted to identify with the people when he was at the front in church. He therefore didn't wear robes at all. He dressed, he said, I dressed just as I am now. He was wearing a 750-pound suit <laughs> with a silk tie and looked like an upper-middle-class banking executive because he wanted to identify with the people. <laughs> well, he might identify with the sort of people who go to his church, some of them, who he wants to go to his church, or with money. But he certainly didn't, I wouldn't, I mean, he'd have walked into the church where I was a vicar, 25,000 people on an overspill council housing estate in Manchester. They'd have said, you're from, you're from Mars. Yeah. On the other hand, if you're going to St. Martin in the field in jeans and a t-shirt to celebrate the Eucharist. Whatever you wear, if you don't wear robes, will exclude people. I don't care who you are, it will exclude people. And people will actually, 68% is what you look like, 28% what you sound like, 7% is what you say. What you look like will make the difference. I'm not too bothered about what it is that you do wear. But the reason that we wear robes, nowadays, I imagine the most common dress for clergy, uh, a, 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 a Eucharist would be a, a plain white album stole. That would be, the, that would be uh, sort of across the board. Some wear chasubles, uh, some don't, and one thing or another. But, but it's, it's simple. It doesn't get in the way, it has a message because the thing that you wear around your neck will probably be of a particular colour that will remind people that this is Easter tide or this is Lent or whatever it is. 
But it doesn't take the, the same when I was shows how long I've been ordained. In <clears throat> 47 years, I was told that when you celebrate the Eucharist, you, nothing about you was getting in the way. So we always wore robes, everybody did in those days. Uh, robes. But you, you didn't wear a wristwatch mm -hmm. and you took rings off. And in fact, in very posh churches, the bishops who knew what they were doing, the bishop wore his bishop's ring until the prayer of consecration. Uh, because it gets in the way. My wife, my wife has a thing about brightly coloured nail polish. She said it really puts her off. She said, well, what colour is I wonder where she got that from. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, she says it's you know, and big earrings. They might be lovely. Do they help or hinder? Do they, for somebody else, get in the way? One more thing, and then we'll come to you, right? I, I mean, I did see somebody once in a church, you know, full one, and, and, and absolutely remember, but carrying a handbag. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that, you know, it got in the way. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Well, I was just going to say that uh, I remember once before I was ordained, um, somebody commented on somebody who was um, administering the chalice of Empress. Um, and she was wearing Pito sandals. Yeah. And she criticised that. And I made a mental note of it. And I always wear proper shoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's, it's not about what it's, it's okay. just about. Does it get in the way or does it help? The, 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 the former Dean of Sheffield, who is now the, the Dean of um, Durham, Michael Sadgrove, uh, in, in, in his room, in, 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 in the Dean's office in the cathedral, had a big, great big cardboard box full of black shoes. And if any servant turned up not wearing black shoes, they had to go in the box and get them, because it might get in the way. I, 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 I mean, that's all it's for, right? Because if you think of, if you just think of yourself, is there anything about my appearance that gets in the way? That's all. How would you know it's going to get in the way? Well, ask people. I, shall, I, I mean, I shall talk about this a, a bit later, about, about preaching. Um, I, I mean, I found the most useful way to improve my preaching was simply to ask two or three people in the congregation, do you mind, I know you might not always do, but this morning, do you mind listening to the sermon? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and afterwards, will you also tell me what you think about it? You know, and just, and really, no, I, I want to improve. So, would you do that? And, 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 and you, you might have one or two people say, this silly blog was said to us, you know, about, you know, what we appear like shouldn't get in the way. Is there anything about me you think gets in the way when I'm, you know, when I'm saying I've been worried about the list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I wear these shoes a lot. I, I also wear girl functions, so I was yeah. wearing these in church. And one of my friends who I was communion, and afterwards she complimented me and said, Oh, how nice it was. And I immediately thought, I can't wear those again. Quite. I, it, it gets it it. And I miss wearing no girl functions because I don't. Yes, because, because, what you said, yeah. I know. Because, because, you know, body language and all these things, people do notice. I'm going to do this and then I'm going to, we're going to stop. Your voice. I mean, you'll be amazed how many people's voice changes <laughs> in church and becomes what they call pass on. Uh, you will be amazed. But I, I know uh, men, particularly. I've got a big enough voice, I don't need the microphone. Oh. <laughs> you know, I, actually, they can't be heard at all. And they don't re what they don't realize, I've got a big but, you know, there might be quite a number of people in the congregation who depend on the mood. Yeah. Uh, and, and the louder you speak, the worse it goes. You, you know. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's being conscious. Of, and if you need help, get it. The help is available. You know, I, I mean, I know, so, uh, in fact, last Sunday, I was preaching in Essex, where I, 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 I did a mission in, in May. And, and the rector there is a wonderful priest, he's a godly priest, he's very good, but he mumbles. And I couldn't hear him in church, uh, in spite of the microphone and everything, because he, he talks too quickly. And it's such a pity, the Archbishop of York does, he talks probably too quickly. Um, and it's a pity, because what they've got to say is probably very worthwhile. But if I can't hear it, it's a, and if you ask someone, again, you know, can you always understand what I'm saying? Not the content, 
but the, just the, you know, am I clear? When I was at university, training for ordination, we were given elocution lessons every Friday afternoon to get rid of regional accents. <laughs> because in those days, I'm talking about the early 60s, <laughs> they failed miserably. <laughs> Miss Bullock, yes, oh, God, it was awful. Uh, yes, I had to recite these. Father's car is a Jaguar. <laughs> to get the vowels right. And it was, it, she, was all, she was very good, but she was from Rada and all that. But, but, but if there are things that do get in the way in terms of, don't be frightened of getting a bit of help. Because people will really appreciate it. And it's a pity if you work hard at a sermon and people actually can't hear you know, what you're saying. Your body language, again. I had my first curate, didn't realise until I pointed out to him, because that's the biggest job, mm -hmm. would say, you know, the Lord be with you. <laughs> and I'd like to talk this morning about, but he just had this. Oh, you said, Andrew, stop it. And he did stop it. He did stop it. Uh, but, he, but, but he had to be told about it. You see, other, other things. Jack, the one thing that I find most distracting um, when I'm watching someone leading a service is when they sway. Oh, yes. They sway. Yes. That was, people do it. And, yes, and, they and do. They're not, they're, they're not, not conscious they're of it. No, they're not. But, but I've always said to curates, you know, stop swaying. You know, yes. Because it, it's so distracting. <laughs> Isn't it? It is. It is. And, it, and you do it unconsciously because you, I, I don't know why you do it, but people comfort. sort of... It's a comfort. Comfort. Isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Whatever it is, it's... Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine was bored of me without me knowing on yes. the phone. And of course, I logged for early in training actually when I was preaching and I was horrified. But of course, it was very useful and actually so easy to have a video of someone doing something. And it's easy to not say anything, just look at it. And then you learn it all yourself. Know, so. <laughs> Hands and eyes. Two things. When you're addressing God, you don't look at people. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, and all desires are open. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen particularly when they're singing, you know. Yes. Glory to God in the highest. Peace to his people on earth. <laughs> so when, when, when you're addressing God, you either look, you know, focus somewhere there, right? Almighty God, uh, 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 you know, or close your eyes, but whatever. You don't look at people when you're addressing God. And when you're addressing people, you look at people. The Lord be with you. Not the Lord be with you. It's all right for Almighty God unto whom I am. But not for the Lord be with you. It's not all right for Almighty God. The Lord be with you. You look at peace, the peace of the Lord. Be always with you. So it's, it's, it's stewardship of the eyes. And stewardship of the hands. Um, this is... Um, me now. Since we, we retired to a small place and on the first Sunday went to the local church, my wife won't let me go back. She said, <laughs> because she said, it's just not good for my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I was so angry. The way that this man, well, what he said in his sermon, but also the way, the way that he, he did it. And the Eucharistic prayer, it was right in. Um, the elements were there. He had a um, laminated card with the Eucharistic prayer on, and he leant on the altar. Uh, so that when the same night that he was betrayed, to bread. And, you know, what does that say? It, it, but it was true, though. It happened. I mean, you would not believe, you know, what poor bishops have to go from. <laughs> <laughs> the hands, right? The rule of, traditionally, the rule of thumb is very simple. If you are praying with people, <coughs> you hold your hands together. If you are praying on behalf of people, you keep your hands apart. Yeah? Very simple. Yeah, yeah. So, when you say the collect, you know, oh God who at this time sent thine only begotten, you know, da 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 da, hands apart. You are gathering people in. You're praying with them on their behalf. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open and everybody joins in, you put your hands together. Because you're one of them. Mm -hmm. yeah? 
So that's, the, that's the, when you wonder what to do with your hands. That is the simple rule of thumb. When you're praying with people, hands together. When you're praying on behalf of people, you gather them in, hands apart. That's the thing. And finally, <coughs> people are the celebrants. And you are not the celebrant. Yeah. That's why we, I know it's not a nice word. Uh, but that's why the word president, you preside over the service. You don't celebrate it. The people are the celebrants. The people are the celebrants, not you. Uh, they celebrate. And you, with their permission, and I'll come to that in a bit, with their permission, you preside over their celebration. In the Orthodox Church, you cannot have a Eucharist if there are no their people present. So if there's a conference of clergy, and there are, we'll, we'll be all right today because we've got one or two Eucharistic ministers and their sisters. Yeah? So we could have a Eucharist in the Orthodox Church. But, but if they weren't here, then it was just priests. You couldn't. You can't have Eucharist. Because you need the laity there. That, 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 that's the principle of the thing. That it's, it is the whole people of God who celebrate. And I just do things on, on their behalf. Now, that's taken us, let's see you, there you are, I've gone far too long. I think what we'll do is have a breathing space now. Is that all right, Nick? Yeah, if we've we got a breathing space, we'll come back. And then, whilst we're having a breathing space, you might think of things you want to say.